break through the walls of our heart. Break through all the garbage that this life fills us with, surrounds us with. Lord, in your awesome power, it's not even difficult for you, God. Just ask that we would follow you. look to you this morning. Call on the name of Jesus. Heal our hearts, God. Lord, revive us again, we pray. Lord, that our choice would be for you, above all else, God, as a precious jewel. It's the precious Lamb of God. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning. You have done so much and given so much. And we are not in any way worthy of all that you have. As the creator, you've created the stars and the heavens and the glory that is of them. And you've looked down upon us. What is man? What are we that you would look upon us and extend your glory to us. So Lord, we just lift up the name of Jesus in which it is all possible. And we give you all the praise and the glory for all that we do and all that we say. Let it lift up your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It is a great thing to come under the hand of a mighty God, but only if you are one who is his friend. I dare say if you are an enemy of God, you do not want to be under his thumb, because there's no wiggling out of that. There's no escaping from the wrath of God if you do not have him deep in your own heart and soul. So last week, we celebrated the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And we went through those days in which Jesus was betrayed, and he was arrested, and he was beaten and tortured and ridiculed and mocked. And then he rose up upon the cross and he gave his life. He yelled out, it is finished. And I'm sure those around him and even the devil himself wondered, what does that mean? He's finished. He's dead. Get him off that cross, bury him, put him away. We're done. Stick a fork in it, it's done. And little did they know the mystery that God had hidden within. Just like a seed must be buried and died before it can rise up and grow to a great tree and produce fruit, Jesus also had to die. And upon the third day, he rose from the dead. And we did spend last week going through those details of the great resurrection that he brought. Even to the point of looking beyond that, in Thessalonians, Pastor read concerning the rapture of the church, the taking away which will come at the appointed hour. But we're not there yet. And this morning I wanted to take a little bit of a look the day after, the week after, 
when Jesus had risen. And so we're going to take a look at the end of Luke 24, and starting in verse 46. It's the very last chapter of Luke. And the chapters preceding this um, was the crucifixion and the resurrection. And here Jesus is with his disciples. Verse 46, then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of those things. Behold, I send you the promise of my Father, upon which you... Oh, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. So here we have the disciples coming together with Jesus and spending the last moments with him on that day. Now, there is some time that transpired between them. Um, if we look over to the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 15, Paul writes about some of those people that were witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. And in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, starting in verse 4. I believe it is. Yes, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4, Paul writing, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, and then by the twelve. Cephas is another name for Peter, Simon Peter. So he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve, and after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James. This James here is the brother of Jesus who wrote the book of James um, later on in the Bible, or the half-brother of Jesus, because James did not have the same father in the same way, but he had the same mother. Um, so he's seen by James and then all of the apostles Verse 8, and then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. So these other visitations, these, these sightings of Jesus occurred during these first days after the resurrection. And at first when I was reading some of this, I'm like, oh, he saw all those people on one day? Wow. Wow. He saw, you know, all these apostles, and then, you know, he was busy. He rose up that Sunday morning, and he saw the ladies at the tomb, and then he went and saw the men walking on the road to Emmaus, and then he saw the disciples, and then he saw the apostles, and then he saw 500 people. I mean, he was a busy, busy guy. But actually, we, we find out um, that that's not the case. Um, Paul kind of alludes to this a little bit, but when he writes here about his being... Um, one born out of due time um, is because Paul, who was previously named Saul, did not see Jesus during this time. He was not one of those 500 or one of the disciples or one of the believers that saw Jesus on those days. It was later on that Jesus, in his resurrected, full, glorious form, met Paul, then Saul, on the road to Damascus. Um, and, in fact... Partly we know he was in his glorious form because the other people that was with Paul didn't see Jesus. They saw the horse reacting. That I think it was a horse he was riding on or a donkey. I don't remember. Um, and they heard some rumblings like thunder. 
but they did not see Jesus or hear what he said. Um, but Paul had this visitation and saw Jesus uh, again as one out of time. Um, so what, what was the exact frame in which um, these other people were seen? So if we look to the book of Acts, which is the first book following the four Gospels, in Acts chapter 1, um, we see it written, it says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now, the book of Acts was written by Luke, the same one who wrote the Gospel of Luke. Um, he was a physician and somewhat of a historian. Um, we, we read in verse 2, uh, it says, uh, Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Um, so here we see uh, Luke is writing... Um, concerning those visitations during those sightings. And so it was a period of 40 days, and not just one day, in which he saw the different groups of disciples and believers and, as, and uh, assembled together, perhaps, it says 500 at once. Um, and the thing that kind of comes to my mind is we read in the Gospels where Jesus met with 5,000 at one time or another, uh, in fact, the story of the fishers and loaves, one of them, he was met with 500 men in addition to that women and children. Um, and so perhaps there were many days in which he saw 500. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think about that sometimes. I'm like, wow, Jesus is risen from the dead. And it wasn't just one day where he was up and gone and everybody's like telling all these stories about it, but he was wandering around with them for 40 days. I imagine that there would have been quite a bit of stir concerning this Jesus walking around with his disciples. I mean, there were throngs of people there just a week prior to that during the triumphal entry. They were all there, Hosanna, waving their palm branches Hosanna, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. And yet here we have, I mean, 500 is still a good group of people. I mean, we have about 400 chairs, I think, in this room. Um, so if we were to fill this up to overflowing, there'd be about 500, room for 500 in here. And that's a pretty amazing crowd, I do believe. But somehow I, I think that maybe there was more than one occurrence of 500, perhaps. I don't know. We know what we're told. Um, one of the things that's interesting here is um, if you do look at that first verse in Acts chapter 1, he says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. If you take a look at Luke chapter 1, and you don't have to turn there, I'm just going to read like the first verse. Well, actually, not the first verse, but a couple of verses in Luke chapter 1. Um, he writes, It seemed good to me, having been having had perfect understanding of all things. This is Luke 1, verse 3. It seemed to me, uh, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Now, some scholars believe that this Theophilus was an individual that Luke was writing to, maybe a pen pal. Um, but his name, Theophilus, means beloved of God. So it could just be translated, um, here I am writing to you, now that I have perfect understanding of all things, I want to write to you in order of the account, most excellent beloved of God. Um, what we see in the writings of Paul, usually he starts out, beloved, beloved of God, brethren, you know, that sort of... Um, conversation as, as he's greeting the brothers in Ephesus or Corinthians or wherever he's writing to. And so it could be that this is just written to one person where it was shared with others. Um, it could be that he is just writing to us as the church. 
Now, the book of Luke, um, according to my notes, was written about A.D. 60. So this was some 30 years after the resurrection. And Luke has become now to have a perfect understanding or a complete understanding of, of all these things that have happened. And so he writes. And he is respected as one of the historians of the first church. And in fact, his writing of the book of Luke and the book of Acts comprises more than half of the entire New Testament. A lot of us think about Paul and how Paul wrote so many letters, but the content, as far as the bulk number of words, you might say, um, were actually given to us by Luke. Um, and he, as a physician, as a doctor, as a, a person of science, perhaps you might say, wants to give an accurate, orderly account of all these things. And so he writes then in the book of Luke concerning uh, Jesus and his actions and his walkings on the earth, and then he re continues to write that uh, as he writes the book of the Acts of the Apostles, the story after the resurrection and what happened to those during that early church. Um, and so we see here these 40 days in which Jesus walked the area around Galilee, Jerusalem, and Israel. Again, upwards of 500 people saw him, met with him, touched him, witnessing his complete resurrection. Um, in fact, we, we see uh, Jesus mentioning a couple of times where that he r r spread out his hands and even his feet for them to see the holes that he had from the nails on the cross and his feet where the nail went through his feet upon the cross. And I don't think he would do that if he didn't... I, th I think some people discount the, the validity of the cross and the power. Um, there are some who even discount that it was a cross. They think, oh, it was just a stake or just a, a tree. Um, but it is something that has stood the test of time throughout, and yet here Jesus is kind of pointing out to them, hey, I was on the cross. You can see the holes from the nails still there. Um, we read, uh, if you look just a verse or two back in Luke 24 at the end, um, this is from Luke 24, verse 40. It says, when he had said this, oh, here it is in verse 38, why are you troubled and why do you have doubts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said, have you any food? Have you any food here? And so they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took it and ate in their presence. I mean, just kind of hanging out with Jesus. Hey, hey, I've been on a long journey. Do you have any food? I'm kind of hungry. You know, it's, um, it's just kind of amazing to think. I mean, some, things, some people allude to Christians, once they die, that they then become angels, um, that they rise up and they have wings, um, and that we go up and sit on, you know, stay puff clouds, just kind of hanging out. Um, but here's Jesus, in flesh and blood, right there with them, eating some fish and honeycomb. Um, and, th and there's another uh, there's another point where he goes out to see the, the brethren in an, one of the other gospels and they're out fishing and he's like hey did you catch any fish and they're like no we've been here all night we haven't caught anything yet and he says throw your nets on the other side and so they bring in a bunch of fish and there he is with a fire already and some fish on the fire just waiting for them to get back to shore so Jesus the flesh and blood, resurrected from the dead, and not just resurrected in some spiritual ghost kind of form, but in flesh and blood, fully resurrected right there before them in his glory for them to see. It astounds me to just think about that. Because as he ministered, as he walked 
the earth during the times before that he was out ministering to people and healing people and and doing casting out demons and all those things and I imagine even some of that occurred still then here were these people again up to 500 at one time who met with him and traveled with him over a period of 40 days that's 40 days that's over a month that's like four weeks plus a few right um, or is it five weeks my math is eluding me at the moment and so he was traveling with them sitting down to eat with them and I'm sure that he was still ministering to them and people were coming and seeing Jesus and believing in him and yet we read in this passage in Luke 24 he says behold I send the promise of my father upon you I mean hey they spent time they were walking around with Jesus they were hanging out with him I'm sure he was sharing with them he was teaching them we in one of those other verses um, before we read there verse 45 it says and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures so they're sitting around hanging with Jesus I mean the most amazing man in the world and they're sitting around hanging around with him and just being filled with all this understanding and wisdom and just overflowing with joy to just be hanging out with Jesus and he says but I'm gonna send the promise of my father and they're like what there's more I mean we're with you Jesus what else do we need we could just hang out here forever I mean, you know, you've got your angels that could come and, you know, keep the Romans away from us or whatever. I'd like to take a look, if you are still in Luke, to flip over to John chapter 14. Because prior to his death, Jesus had spent some time talking to them about the days that would come. Part of it, he talked about wars and rumors of wars and the tribulation and, and the end times and his, and his coming back for them to take them to heaven. And that he's going to you know, go up there, prepare them mansions and all those things. But he also talked to them about the days following his resurrection. In John chapter 14, uh, verse 15, here he spends a little bit of time talking with them. And again, this is here right before his crucifixion and all of those things John chapter uh, 14 verse 15 if you love me keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you I will not leave you orphans I will come to you a little while longer and the world will see me no more but you will see me because I live you will live also at that day you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you so here they've come to that moment that he's talking about a little while longer and the world will see me no more he died the world saw him no more and yet you will see me and because I live you will live also and again some of this is alluding to that moment at the resurrection when he rises up and he's with them and some of it is alluding to more but because he talks about that he's gonna send them a helper that he may abide with you forever let's uh, f go down here to verse 26 it's saying John 14 but the helper the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Verse 28, you have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. So he says, I'm going to send you the helper, but I'm going to be with you and you should rejoice that I'm saying I'm going to be going from you 
And again, these things are happening now with them. They're remembering some of these things that he had taught them, and he's probably teaching them again. He's referring these things back to them again to remember, these are the things I told you. I'm going to the Father, and I need to go to my Father. And I've told you before, so then when it happens, you'll believe. And so Jesus died, he rose from the dead, it happened just as he said, and now they believe. Let's flip over to John 15, 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. So again, Jesus is speaking about the Spirit of Truth. Jesus has been with them. He's been with him. And they're going to bear witness of these things, because he is, they have been with him from the beginning. Over to John 16. Just flip a page in my book. I still have many things to say to you, verse 12, but you cannot bear them now. And again, this he is talking to them right before Gethsemane, right before the persecution, right before his death. He says, I have many things to say to you, but you can't receive them now. But now he's reminding them as he's spending these 40 days with them, he's going over these things now that he had spoken of before. Verse 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. And all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Verse 16, a little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. And verse 20, most assuredly I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. And this is what they've experienced. A little while from this moment, Jesus died. He was being persecuted. And all of the disciples, every one of them, ran and hid. In fact, one of them was running so fast that the, it says that one of the temple guards grabbed his coat and he ran off naked, leaving his coat behind. Maybe not completely naked, but... I mean, they were such in a hurry to get out of there, and we see even later on, as you, as you read through the times of Jesus' persecution, that Peter came along and pretended not to know Jesus as he was warming his hands by the fire with the general populace, but someone recognized him. And he said, no, that's not me. I wasn't... that wasn't me. I don't know Jesus. And then we also see there was the one who who was the beloved, John, who also kind of followed along at a distance to see what was happening. But all of the other disciples, all of them flew and hid for fear of the Romans and the Jews and the temple police coming after them. Because if Jesus is going to be arrested, then they're next. Because they were following him and they were saying the same things that he said. They were teaching the same things that he taught. And they were afraid. And so here now, we're reading what he was telling them before, and then he's reminding them. He says, yeah, you were in sorrow. You were weeping and lamenting, and you were in fear. The world was rejoicing. We killed another prophet. We killed this guy who said he was the son of God, Jesus. And now we can go on in our religious ways. The world was rejoicing, but they were in sorrow. And their sorrow was turned into joy. On that Sunday morning, the first day of the week, when Jesus rose from the dead and they saw him. And for 40 days they saw him and ate with him and learned from him and took from him all this great wisdom and understanding. 
And yet, he said, wait, because there's more to come. There's more yet to happen. So after three days, Jesus was dead. Their, their sorrow turned to joy. Jesus was with them during these 40 days, and they were enlightened. He opened up their understanding. And not only concerning these things that he taught them, but he taught them from the scriptures. I'm reminded of the passage which you probably are familiar with also in Luke 24, on the road to Emmaus. I believe this was the day when Jesus was resurrected. He was met these two believers as they were walking on the road to Emmaus and they were talking about the crucifixion and all the things that was happening in town. And He was like, oh, well, what, are you, what are you talking about? And they were, what? You hadn't heard? <laughs> Where have you been? There's this guy Jesus. And he was telling all these great things and teaching people about hope and love and peace and healing people and he was arrested and and then all these things that he said, you know, people are wondering, was he just a big, you know, liar? Was he telling all these fables just to get people, you know, to give him money or something? You know, we don't understand. And so Jesus walked with them and told them. Their eyes were opened. And they knew him. And verse uh, 24, chapter 24 of Luke and verse 31, it says, Their eyes were open and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Uh, verse 27, it says, The beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures concerning himself. And I'm sure much of this also transpired during those 40 days. That he was reminding them of the things that he said, but he was also going back and showing them again these scriptures in the Old Testament. He was teaching them and opening to them, and probably for the first time, I'm sure it was for the first time, they perfectly understood the things that he was saying. And why is that? I mean... Luke writes what we read before that, that he was he has a perfect understanding now of these things that he's explaining to them. Why was it that now they were able to understand? Well, the Bible tells us that the natural man does not perceive the things of the spirit, but the spiritual man, which is one who has the spirit of God, then does perceive and understand. And so this is what has happened. They are now believers. They are Christians on this day. He rose up from the dead, and they saw it, and they believed. And if for some reason one of them had fallen asleep or died during those 40 days, they would have gone directly to heaven. There was nothing else they needed to do to be with God forever and ever. Because they had received Jesus. And he was with them, teaching them, and they had received the Spirit inside of them so that their understanding was enlightened, so that they understood the Scriptures. Not just as he taught them, but their, enlightened, their whole understanding was enlightened. And they perceived and understood. Just like the, the other thief on the cross. You know, there were three, three crosses, according to our understanding. Jesus in the middle and there are two thieves on either side. One of them was mocking and scorning with the crowd. The other one was saying, mercy. Please remember me when you get to your, your, your place. And Jesus said, surely I say to you that you will be with me today, this day in paradise. And so that man died and he was with the Father. He believed. He believed who Jesus was and Jesus said, you will be with me today. I'm not so sure about some of the other disciples though on that day. I don't know. We are not told about others who died during those three days in which Jesus was in the tomb. But I do know that here during these 40 days, they had received the Spirit, they were born again, they had accepted, they fully knew and believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. Is that enough? Let's see, Romans 8. I remember this scripture, I memorized it years ago, but now I've, I need to read it just to make sure. 
Romans 10, 9, and 10. That's the one. I didn't have this plan, but hey, God is good. Amen. Um, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And you've probably heard it. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's kind of a recipe. If you confess with your mouth Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That is it. That is all you need. That's enough. When Jesus said it is finished, that's part of it too. Everything that you need to have to be saved and to be with God and to be in heaven is done on that day when he died and he rose from the dead. That is it. Your salvation is complete. And yet for 40 days he spent time talking to them, teaching with them, sharing with them his understanding of the scriptures. And they were enlightened and they were encouraged and they were filled with joy and overwhelming joy and love and peace just filled their hearts. And yet Jesus says, but wait, there's more. And I, I want to just highlight with these verses that we read in John. And I'm just going to highlight some of those points that we read in John 14, 15, and 16. In John 14, 16, Jesus tells them that the Spirit abides with us forever. Verse 17, He is the Spirit of truth that the world cannot receive. Also in verse 17, You know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. And here I believe He's talking about two things concerning the... Jesus Himself has been with them, present tense, or past tense, and then future tense, speaking of the Spirit of Christ, will be in them. Because the Spirit, you know, wasn't in them yet. Because at the point when he was teaching them, he, they had not believed. He had not risen from the dead yet. Verse 20, at that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. That's one of those things that the Spirit now comes and gives to us, that we will know that Jesus is in the Father, and that we are in him and that he is in us that's one of those things that the spirit does verse 21 i will manifest myself to you that jesus manifests shows himself to us verse 26 the helper the holy spirit the father sends in my name and verse 26 the spirit will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things i said to you and those of you that are clever might see how that we see the, the Trinity right there. The Father sends the Spirit in the name of Jesus. You've got all three there focusing on, on the different aspects of who they are and what they're doing. But the Spirit is being sent by the Father in the name of Jesus, and He will come, the Spirit, to teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Verse 29, I have told you before it, com before it comes that when it does come to pass, you will believe. And so he prophesied of these things that he would be doing and saying. Chapter 15, verse 26, the spirit of truth that is sent by Jesus and proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Testify of Jesus. The spirit will testify of Jesus. Verse 27, and you will also bear witness having been with Jesus from the beginning. Chapter 16, verse 7, I go away for your advantage. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come. The Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, then I go so that I can send him to you. And again, th these, are, these are things that Jesus is talking about before he died, and I'm sure he alluded to them during these 40 days that, hey, I'm here with you now, but I still have to go. I cannot stay here hanging out with you eating fish and chips or fish and honeycomb. 
I know it's great. The fellowship is great. The knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding is great. Just hanging out with Jesus. And yet there's more. He says there's more. The helper's going to come and he's going to do all of these things. 16 verse 12. The spirit will guide you into all truth. The helper. And what he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Verse 13. And he will take things that are of the Father and of Jesus and he will declare them to you. All of these things, Jesus is reminding them that this is yet to happen. In Acts chapter 1, we see that Jesus was with them and he spent these 40 days going back to Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when, he, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The promise of the Father had not yet been given to them. They were born again. They had received the Spirit. They were able to understand when Jesus taught them. When they were taught, they were able to understand the things that they were being told. And yet there was more. He said, there's this promise of the Father, the Helper, the Holy Spirit's going to come, and you're going to have even more than me just sitting here being with you teaching. Could you imagine if Jesus himself was here every Sunday? I think we'd have a few more of these seats filled. I think. Yeah, maybe. I guess we, we might have to advertise, hey, Jesus is coming. Jesus is appearing, and he's going to do, you know a series of lessons um, at our church. And um, I wonder if we'd get some people to come. I mean, can you just imagine sitting before Jesus, having him teach you the word and the scriptures and just sharing with you and hanging out, eating treats and drinking coffee across the way with you. And yet he said, I can't stay. As much as this is great for you, I cannot stay. I've got to go. There is still a promise of the Father that is yet to be delivered to them. In verse 5 we read, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit many days from now. And the baptism of John we know was an immersion, a complete drenching. He would take them down to the river and he would dunk them in the water. And this is the allegation, the, the, not allegation, the illusion I don't know, analogy, maybe that's the better word, that Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit is not just going to be in you, he's going to be in you. He's going to be on you, he's going to be with you, he's going to be dwelling, abiding with you forever, he said. And the Helper's going to do all these things, he's going to teach you and guide you and train you and lead you and walk with you and teach you and speak the things of the Father and of Jesus to you. And while they waited for 40 days, they had to wait more because he said, stay. I've got to go, but you just stay here in Jerusalem waiting for the promise of the Father. And they did not have long to wait because as we look to Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, the day of Pentecost had fully come. They were all in one accord in one place. Well, they had been hanging out. They had been waiting. Because they were faithful, they were like, if Jesus got all this to us just while he's here, then there must be something else great that's coming. And so they waited. And on that day of Pentecost, now the day of Pentecost is also in the Bible, it's called the Feast of Weeks. It is, occurs 50 days after the, the Passover, when Jesus died and, and when he rose. So 50 days later. So they waited 40 days, and then another 10 days or so. And the day of Pentecost had fully come, and then they were there. 
in an upper room or in some place near the temple, waiting and praying and worshiping God. In verse 2, it says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then appeared to them di divided tongues of fire, and one sat upon each of them, verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now back in verse 8, I read, it says, when the, when, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now this word power is a Greek word dunamis, and we get our word dynamite from that. Um, he says, when the Holy Spirit's going to come on you on this promise, when the promise of the Father is going to come on you, when the Helper is going to come and be with you and abide with you forever, then there's going to be this power, this dynamic power that's going to be upon you. And you are then going to be witnesses of me. You're going to testify of me. You're going to be out there doing the things that I have done. And it's going to be this powerful witness that he is going to be with them and upon them. And yet he had to go. He had to leave so that the Holy Spirit would be able to come. This 50 days Pentecost. Now as I was reading this, and, and you'll read the, the description of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks in the book of Leviticus, um, an interesting thing that I saw was when they had the Passover, and like we usually do with our communion, we do like a flat bread that has no leaven. Leaven is like yeast. It makes the, the bread rise so that you have loaves. Well, in the Feast of Weeks, they're not eating this Passover flat bread anymore. They have loaves of bread. And which this one scholar or, or person was writing about how that they were alluding to that the leaven, which is sin, that in order for us to receive Christ, Sin has to be removed so that we can receive him, we can receive the bread of his broken body and the blood represented by the wine or the juice. We need to remove sin. But after that, that 50 days later, then it's not that sin is there, but hey, we're the church. We're not perfect anymore. And he kind of alludes to that, and I kind of like that. So they're eating loaves because it represents how that all the church now is combined together into one big fluffy loaf. <laughs> We're all here together now. And that he has sent his Holy Spirit, this dynamic power as taught by Jesus, was sent by Jesus from the Father. And that he has come so that we can testify of him. So I want to read just a couple of passages from the book of Acts that kind of alludes to this idea in how in Acts chapter 8, and we're going to also read a little bit from Acts chapter 19, how that these believers, disciples, apostles, followers, on the day of his resurrection became Christians because they believed. And yet there was another promise yet. Even though it was finished for salvation, there was yet more. There was yet a promise that had not been given to them yet because Jesus was with them and so the Holy Spirit couldn't come to be in them. And we read in Acts chapter 8, verse 14, that there were um, some Christians going out and doing ministry. Here it's uh, concerning the ministry of Philip, uh, verse 14 in chapter 8 of Acts. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So this passage here is similar to the waiting that they did. They had received salvation. They had been baptized unto John's baptism into repentance and they believed in Jesus. And yet the Holy Spirit had not fallen upon them. They were still living as Christians, still living as believers, 
still following Jesus and, you know, reading the scrolls or the Old Testament, following him and, and speaking of him and doing what they could of, you know, with him and of him and of the Christians and hanging out. And, but the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen on them. Because they had not received that other promise. They hadn't received the full promise of God yet. In Acts 19, we see another passage, starting in verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And so they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, verse 4, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophecy. And so we have a couple of instances where other believers coming after the day of resurrection, these people were not there. They were not among those 500. These were people in other cities who later on believed in Jesus and had become saved and had repented of their sins and were following Jesus and yet had not fully received the promise of God. And so I, I just put that out there for your consideration. I know many times we find ourselves struggling to serve Jesus, to serve God. The day that we live in is full of conflict and struggle. And the name of Jesus is being put down and thrown out of all, of, all around us the government and the schools and you know, all those things. But just in daily life, it's more and more that, you know, that I, I see things where they go out and talk to young people who have never, never heard of Jesus. I mean, I remember when I was a kid back in the 60s and the early 70s, it seemed like everybody knew who Jesus was. They didn't believe in him, but they had heard. Now, maybe they didn't, you know, we didn't pray when I was in high school. We didn't pray when I was in elementary school. We didn't pray in school. We didn't read Bibles in school. We didn't have Bible classes. But people went to church. Sometimes even just the kids went to church and their parents, you know, would drop them off and pick them up later. But it seemed like everybody knew who Jesus was. I mean, there were movies. There was the Ten Commandments with, you know, all these different things out there. And yet today there's a lot of people who just don't know. And I think it is important for us as Christians to take that extra step to, to follow as the disciples did. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, roll about on the ground and start speaking in tongues. That's not the witness that every person who receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But certainly there is so much more because Jesus said it wasn't just hanging out with Jesus. It wasn't just fellowshipping with the Spirit and just hearing the things and coming to church every day or coming to church every week, once a Sunday or once in a while, to hang out and hear and understand because he said there's more. The promise of the Father is that the Holy Spirit is not just presented to you when you come on Sunday, but that he's with you, he abides with you every day, and he's there to teach you and to guide you and to remind you of the things that God has spoken. And I think it's something that we all should have more of. And years we've sung songs about, you know, come again, refresh me again, O Holy Spirit, because he's got more. He's got more. And yes, it was finished. Yes, if you've believed, you have salvation, but there is more. And there's more to this life, there's more to our walk, there's more abundance of joy and overwhelming peace and security and confidence 
there's this dunamis dynamite power that God has for every one of us. And it's more, and it's available. Amen. So we're going to sing a song, or two, perhaps. If you would like to receive prayer, we have some people who will be up here to pray with you, to pray for you. Or if you just want to come and, and seek God on your own, either at the front on the altar or even just there where you're sitting. I remember many days just turning around in my chair so that I could put my knees on the ground. Because there is so much more. And if you find yourself struggling and you know you're saved, just know that there's more of God that he wants to give you and share with you. To give you strength, to fill you with hope and joy overflowing. Because it's hard for you to share those things if you don't have enough for yourself. Let's worship God. If you want to stay in worship, then please do. Come seek his face with us as we're going to sing. Um, I ask that if you're going to just fellowship, that you can take it across there or at least outside the doors there. And those who want to stay and, and worship and seek God can have a, a place to do that here as we sing. Brother Ben? Thank you.